Okay, um, we're going to have our very quick Q&A. May I get all the speakers up again? Anthony, Benoit, Joanne, JB and Ian. Um, we'll try to keep this short and swift, but I would really appreciate um, questions from the floor because this is really, really organized for you guys. Um, and I know a lot of you are from the film schools, the polys and the universities. Uh, please do not hold your tongue. And there are many, many of you who are independent filmmakers too. So this is a time for you to ask questions. Please come on the stage. Uh, firstly, thank you and congratulations. Thank you for sharing this with us. I think it was uh, a really great experience hearing all your stories about how the film was made and stuff like that. So um, I was curious about the sound of the film since it wasn't touched on. So whether there was a sound designer and a decision for a lack of music. So can you briefly take us through that? Thanks. Anthony? Uh, yeah, because sound is a big part of my work. You know, I focus a lot of time on sound. Actually, we spend quite a, f um, a long period of time, about three, three months working on sound. But we didn't have money, so it was a one-man show. It was... Uh, um, a senior of mine who um, who was also at the National Film School, you know, she's from China and, and she used to work at Shepperton Studios. So we managed to do a deal uh, with Shepperton Studios to actually do our sound mix there. Uh, but unfortunately, we had no money, so we were paying a very, very token fee. Um, so we had to work over Christmas and New Year. So when everyone, it's, it's on holidays, it, it's just me and her working... Um, we had a huge, uh, huge uh, five one Dolby mixing stage to mix all our stuff. But uh, yeah, and and that's where a lot of your huge films are, are mixed as well. But uh, we had to work when no one was working, and it was there was lots of snow, and it was really cold. Um, yeah, and she did most of the pre mixes, the and all that, the dialogue editing on her own uh, in in two, uh, in about two months. Originally, we wanted to do the folly at Shepparton as well, but unfortunately, we didn't have money, so much money, because Ridley Scott booked the team and they had three months to do his folly. So, obviously, you know, Anthony Chen can't win over Ridley Scott when <laughs> Anthony Chen has no money. So, so eventually, because she, 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 she's from China and uh, she used to work at a Shanghai film studio, so we actually did our folly at the Shanghai Film Studio. We didn't go there. We, we gave them very, very specific lists of sounds. We sent them, you know, the different tracks that needs to be folded, and, and they did that. Uh, in fact, we were so unhappy sometimes with the quality of their work that we got them to redo all the folded three times. Yeah. Okay. Um, hold on a bit. There's, yeah, the lady at the back in... White, I believe, uh, yeah, extreme left. Yep. Yeah, if you could actually introduce yourself and where you're from. Thank you. Yeah, my name is Bernice. I'm from Malaysia. So I can ask the rude question JB. that the Singaporeans won't feel so offended by asking. First question I have is, I'm curious to know why you didn't use a screenwriter. I ask only because I am one. <laughs> and so I'm very curious why directors sometimes choose to write their own screenplays without the use of a screenwriter? Uh, uh, it's a great question, but perhaps you need to understand that you know I've always written and directed all my shorts. All the 10 short films that I made before this, I wrote and directed. But I have to tell you, writing a feature is so tough, I don't think I want to write the next one. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm, almost, I'm almost very, very sure, almost 100% sure that the next film, uh, I'll be working on someone else's work. Yeah. And my second question was actually just out of curiosity because you mentioned that the budget on this film was extremely low. What was your budget? It wasn't extremely, extremely low. You know, we, we, I, I, I think you, you have to say that it's low by international standards. You know, we made the film on about 600, 650. Now it has come up to, you know... Sing. Sing, sing yeah, not ring it. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and um, and I think with all the other deliverables that we deliverables that we churn out and all that as we have projected and budgeted, you know, it's 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 just about seven. 
So the whole budget was seven, you know, after all the deliverables and the shipping and the hard disk and every, every other thing that needs to be delivered. Um, yeah. So is it small and tiny? No, this is not a 100,000 film. This is not a 200,000 film. But if you were to think about making a film uh, with proper resources, I'm not saying like, actually all these people, you know, including the post, everyone is paid so little. But it's not about that, but it's about putting proper resources into casting, proper resources into props, into art direction. Um, um, it's, it's all that that actually costs a lot of money, and, and as well as uh, shooting the right number of days. Um, I know, and I know right now it's a huge, huge industry practice, and I'll say openly to shoot a film, a feature film in 15 days, 16 days. Um, but any actor would tell you that, you know, uh, in Chinese, I would say, you know, 演员都还没有热身就停了, you know. Even before the actors have actually warmed up, you know, to speed, the film is over. And, and, and I think, yes, uh, yes, you know, we, we make very, very, we are very pragmatic, you know, country, we are a very practical country, we sort of, oh, let's just see how much money we shoot, how many days, but can this story be told in that many days? Because what you end up sh filming, you know, the kind of shots, you know, Joanne keep talking about Actually, the word she used was coverage, and then she said choreography. Actually, it was more choreography than coverage, because I, I don't like to shoot coverage. You know, most people that work with me know that I don't like to just shoot all kinds of shots everywhere. But for me, every shot needs to be precise. You know, it, that movement is there for the sake of a, cert, you know, a, a certain reason. So can you actually be able to um, tell a film uh, dutifully, faithfully, you know, in those number of days, um, yeah, you know, and, and not compromise on production values, uh, compromise on aesthetics. I think that's, that's, you know, we didn't, we didn't make a film in a million, you know, it wasn't like, oh, we spent a million dollars or 1.5 million because that wasn't, I, I don't think that was, uh, that would be fair. Because whenever you make a film, you're not using your own money, you know. Whether it's an MDA or whether it's an institution or this film, we had Neon coming in. Or whether it was, you know, some private investors. For me, I'm always very careful because, you know, because I'm not using my own money, I have to work even harder. Um, so, so I, 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 yeah, I think that's, 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 that's my thoughts um, with regards to, yes, the budget doesn't, we keep saying, oh, we didn't have a lot of money. Yes, uh, because we had to put money in the right places. And sometimes you sort of see on the screen, you can see in, in some works where, yeah, actually it looks a bit empty here. You know, it doesn't feel, it feels like this needs, you know, another day to shoot. You know, the scene seems to be collapsing at its ages. Um, yeah. Okay, there's a question somewhere here in the front just now. Yes. Um, okay, I'll pass you my mic. I'm curious as to how long you took to write the first word of your script and how, you know, when it, to the point where you started filming it. Um, how long did that process take? And you mentioned there was a memory that triggered the story. Um, you have, this is your third film. What inspired each script? And this is my how first long? film. This is my first full length film. Yeah. You know, I mean, I've made like 10 shots, but this is my first full length film. Um, what was the question again? <laughs> How long it took? Oh, it uh, took two years. No, and the, until the final draft, where, that means it's the shooting draft, it was two years. Um, yeah, it was two years before. And actually, that isn't very long because, you know, in the UK, sometimes it takes three to five. Okay, there's a question behind uh, the lady. Yep. Uh, Dalika Raj, I'm an anthropologist and a writer, and this is another writing question. You said a little bit about um, the process of writing. Could you elaborate? Is this? I know you seem allergic to genres, but is this a work of fiction, creative memoir? Is it autobiographical, biographical? There's something that's there that's universal, as you've said that touches us. So I wondered if you would reflect on that. And then could you say a little bit about what a day in a life of Anthony Chen, the writer, looks like? Um, um, 
uh, it's a film that's inspired by childhood memories. I would say it's not autobiographical. I did share a little bit that if it was, I struggled when it was more autobiographical. But I took a lot of events uh, and characters uh, and 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 certain words that were said, you know, certain things, and and I actually stranded all this together and and joined, you know, and all these devices. You know, as you started to plot it, you know, you set it up and then you pay it off. It, it you, you started to sort of find a clean structure for it. It's a very very organic process, which is why I I think I think I can I can teach screenwriting from a textbook. You know, because I've been trained not in one film school but two film schools. But I'm not sure. I I I would tell you that I I really practice screenwriting. You know, in in that fashion. Um, what was the second question again? Day what in a, a day in a life of writing? Uh, I don't know. There are days where I can't write a single word. I, I can't write at home. I know that. Because I'm just so uh, distracted whenever, whenever I'm at home. So I can't write at home. Usually I write, write best uh, in a cafe or something like that. And sometimes uh, when the pressure kicks in, I write better. <laughs> like when I'm scared. You know, I, I'm driven by fear. Yeah. I'm driven by fear. Like, oh no, oh no. Like, this has to be right. You know, we have to shoot in like four months. This has to be right. Yeah. Um, Chet? Yeah. You have to give the Hi. East Coast some <coughs> chances. But Chet. Yeah, I'm, I'm Chet Chun and I'm on a really long lunch break right now. <laughs> um, I'd like to thank everyone for giving us the insight into your decision making, like the choice of cameras and so on. I was just wondering, since this was a dated piece like 98, did, did the thought of green screening did it factor very much into your decision making at all? Never. I think I think Benoit could answer that question. Yeah, using green screen on this film. Uh, the, actually, not green screen. We never we never thought of that. Yeah. There's no. It's there's nothing natural for. I mean, you feel, and we would not have the facilities anywhere to do it properly, and that's. I mean, the thing is. Most, most of the thing we did for the film during the Ricky was to look for areas where there was no modern areas. And it was quite hard to find. I mean, there was one region, like in Tampanese, where we found the flat, basically, where it was still old-looking HDBs. Yeah, I, I don't think that was ever discussed. Because if you look at the look of the film, really it was about presenting something that was genuine, something that was heartfelt, something that was authentic. In fact, I'm very, very wary of uh, you know, painted skies and, and things like that. You know, we, I think that's the problem where, you know, I don't think I can comment on it. I'm not a big, you know, Hollywood, you know, filmmaker, but I think that's the problem why right now budgets are just shooting higher and higher and, and why visual effects artists are complaining about wages and all that is because 20 years ago, perhaps 10, 20% of work is done digitally. Now every single shot in a Hollywood film has to have effects. If you go on like that, yeah, obviously the post-production companies are going to go bust. Because everything, we can shoot anything and then just green screen it and then we paint everything in post. But to paint it in post, it takes another 200 people to do it. So I'm, I'm, I'm not, you know, I, I'm not entirely sure. You know, I'm not, I'm not a... a, a, a uh, I don't think I'm, I'm completely convinced by all this CG painted skies and buildings and all that. I think it's great, um, but you know, if we get so addicted to it, it's not, it's, it's never going to stop. Okay. Okay, we have we have some questions on this side. Um, over there, Rod, please raise your hand so that the mic can be put to you. Yeah, go ahead, Rod. Okay. Uh, the relationship between the maid and the child was so important. Did you read them together before you cast them? Or at what point did they come together to actually read for you? Uh, no, I didn't because I, I casted the actress in the Philippines and I casted the boy in Singapore and we didn't have money to fly her in uh, you know, just, for, just for reading or to test, for testing on, and, and things like that. Yeah, but what I did do was I did bring the adult actors to some of my workshops with kids to, to just look at how it feels, you know, with them around kids and whether, you know, they, they connected with children in a, in a parent sort of way. Like I said, you know, both of them were not parents. Okay. I, I wanted to follow up with one... Very quickly, yeah. Uh, did you do... You, you, 
your own producing? Did you do your own producing? And, uh, and if so, uh, would you consider the next time uh, working with a creative producer? Uh, I had a producer on the film. Yeah, but I was, I was doing uh, co-producing, I would say that. Yeah, because, um, because my producer actually came from a more EP background, so she wasn't so familiar with the line production side of things. So I needed to make sure that both sides actually gelled well together. Yeah, will I produce again? Hopefully not. <laughs> it's too painful. Three years on and I'm still working. <laughs> There's uh, the lady in black, yeah. Um. You shared with us your strategies on, um, you know, sales. What about your strategies or your experiences in um, the financing process of this film? Uh, I, you know what? Actually, that wasn't that wasn't the hardest part. I thought. Um, I think uh, for the money from the Singapore Film Commission MDA because they had the N N Triple F. You know, now it's now defunct. You know, it, it's, it's been renamed and, and now it's a grant. Before it was an investment, a new feature film fund. Um, because of my track record with my shorts, um, um, and also I think we had quite a strong proposal um, treatment for the film. I think that wasn't so hard. Uh, you know, I'm very grateful that we had uh, Nian Pauli who came on board. It was the first time actually a film school came on board a feature film. Uh, putting money into a feature film and they took uh, a huge leap of faith. Uh, I remember it, it, it really started um, in 07 after Khan when my short film won and you know I, I met the principal uh, um, uh, at Nian and we had a, a discussion about how you know he, he felt the school could actually help you know when I, when I start making my first feature film and instead of Embarking on my first feature film, I went back to school. <laughs> so when I came back, you know, I, I tried exploring that option again. They have been uh, very, very supportive over the years. I really think that it's a, it's a huge leap of faith. Because I wouldn't be able to say that, oh, this film would do well, or this film will win an award. You know, I could only say that I will, I will work you know, really hard to make the best possible film. That's all I could do. You know, I, I couldn't... Uh, sort of pre-guess where the film is going to go. Uh, uh, my name is Simon Carr, um, uh, teacher and occasional filmmaker. Um, I just mentioned about the, um, the differences between working at Niang Poly and also down at the National, because I know the National is incredibly difficult to get into. So I'm just wondering how they, how they differ and what you learned from them. I think it's, it's, it's different because you go in to Nian at a different age. You know, you go into Nian at 17. <laughs> and, and really a lot of, uh, you know, I think, I think I knew what I wanted, you know, from a very young age. But I think a lot of students were still f trying to figure their way out. Uh, for me, Nian, it's about um, teaching you the basic tools of cinema from, you know, basic screenwriting to cinematography to putting, you know, cuts together. You know, I think without the basic tools, um, you probably wouldn't know how to even make a film. But I think the NFTS, because it's a post-grad program, it's a master's program, it's really about um, training professionals for the industry. Um, yes, it's highly competitive to get in, but at the same time, most of the students that have gone, not all, but most, uh, would have some sort of strong experience uh, making have uh, making a lot of shots before. Um, in fact, in my class, you know, there were quite a few uh, filmmakers that have already been nominated for BAFTA. Have already been at the Venice Film Festival. You know, I already had a short in Cannes. So it was, it was a it was a very strong uh, talent pool of individuals. And of course, it's a it's a much smaller class. I think it used to take six students per per department. Now eight. So eight cinematographers, eight directors, eight production designers, eight editors, eight producers. Uh, like he was in cinematography, I was in, you know, directing. Um, I think what's great is that we, we usually have professionals working with us. Uh, at least we try to. Uh, you know, there is a budget set for a professional AD to come on board. There is a budget set for a professional gaffer, sometimes grip 
you know, when the school still has money. Uh, so that you're, you're sort of trained uh, to work like how you work in the industry. So it wasn't like just, yes, we help one another, but the, the av- regular or average student shoot isn't just, oh, let's just, just steal whatever people we can. You know, we are, we, you are, you're trained as a head of department, basically. I have two questions. Um, did you use a storyboard, and did you follow the storyboard throughout? And the number two question is, um, it seems to me, uh, watching the, after watching the trailer, that your mom was depicted as a villain. Has your mom seen this film, and what, what was her reaction? Uh, first question. Um, there, there isn't a storyboard for, the, for this film. You know, with each film, I think one thing I learned very well in film school is that the story dictates the style. Uh, very much, you know, certain films, I remember I had to make a film in, in, in the first year at the NFTS, Hotel 66, and every shot was storyboarded uh, immaculately because we had to build a set and every, the set was built according to the shots that we wanted to do. But for this film, I wanted something which was more organic in its intent, you know, so it wasn't, um, you would see from the film, this film it doesn't try uh, to show off that, hey, we can shoot beautiful shots. Hey, you know, like, look at this funky colors that we're using. You know, it's, 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 it's going back to basics. It's just really, really uh, naturalistic um, storytelling. And, and I didn't want, you know, to impeach on that. Yeah. So we were always breaking down the shots on yeah. set after the blocking, right? Uh, yeah, but just one thing is... But we, we didn't do any storyboard where we did like shot list. Because that was, I mean, that's always the base where you always refer to if suddenly you get stuck somewhere. Because quite often you, you forget maybe where you are, where you're at. And most of the time it's just a reference because on the day when you see the actors rehearsing and doing the scene, then suddenly you will find better shots or better ideas how to break the scene down. So, yeah. Hi, my name is Ken Chong. I'm a film composer. I'm just wondering whether your music is uh, scored to it or is it from a library music? If not, is it because of a budget issue and how important is music to you? Um, The music that you see in the trailer was written for the trailer. There's no music in the film. I remember there was a composer I really wanted to work with. Uh, He was a year above me in the UK and uh, when we had a cut, that was much longer. It was about two hours. Uh, I, I I sent the cut to him, and and then we came out and said, "Oh, I really like the film, even though it's it's not finished yet. It's still a long cut." Um, but you know, I don't tell this to directors all the time. But I don't think the film needs music. Um, it was interesting because me, Joanne, and our other editor, hoping while we are cutting the film we had no idea where to put the music cues. Because most of the time you would know, you see, where to put the music cues. But it was so full in a way that we had no idea where to put. So we, we sort of, we threw it over to uh, the composer that I wanted to work with and say, okay, maybe he knows where to put the music cues. And he came back with that. Um, so so eventually we, we, we talked about it uh, for quite some time. And quite soon we actually decided that we didn't need music in the film. Yeah, so what you hear, uh, if you hear music in a film, it's usually diegetic. Yeah. Yeah, uh, you know, you mentioned a few times that you, uh, well, you didn't have enough budget to do certain things, you didn't have enough money, despite the fact that you have funding from the Film Commission and the Media Development Authority and uh, I think a few others. So is it a case where the funding is not up to scratch? Do you feel that it should be better? Funding uh, levels uh, for filmmakers, and in light of the, the the glory that you brought to filmmaking in Singapore, do you think that this should justify increased funding, you know, for <laughs> for the uh, filmmakers? But having said that, are there like also should we be wa- uh, should the filmmakers be wary of what kind of like strings that are attached to this kind of funding? You know, like uh, do they come with certain sort of uh, conditions or? Um, uh, it's, do you have to depict Singapore in a very nice way or something? You know, like the kind of thing. Just curious about this kind of. 
well, you don't see any STB shots in, in my film. You don't see Marina Bay Sands. You don't see the Singapore Flyer. You probably, yeah, I, I would say there isn't a single postcard shot in this film. You know, whatever you see, it's, 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 it's raw, it's natural. Um, it's a very good question, but I have to say this. Um, it's my first feature. Um, like I said, you know, I, I didn't have all that money. If I had all that money, then it's, that's my problem. You know, because, whether it's taxpayers' money, whether is it you know the school's money or private investors, it's other people's money. So for me, because it's my first feature, I, I wanted to um, sort of do it in a way such that we 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 are, when yes we could actually budget the film much higher, but the point is that that creates added stress and added risk for everyone. You know, I'll be worried. The people who are putting money will be worried. Um, yeah, this this isn't. Um, if, if you look at, you know, the film, it's not the most commercial thing, you know, you're not looking at Wolverine. <laughs> so, uh, although I heard that wasn't a very good film, um, <laughs> from people that have seen it. Um, uh, so, so I think it's, it's, it's perhaps, I think when you are, you have proven yourself, when, yes, I've proven myself in shorts, but I haven't made a single film full-length film, and perhaps I, I wouldn't know how to make a full-length film. I think it's very important uh, to be conservative. I think it's very important uh, to give yourself less stress. Uh, that's one thing I learned from a very good... Actually, that's the best lesson that he taught from Stephen Frears. <laughs> you know, that he, he learned, you know, through his life, because he was one of the uh, key tutors at the National, uh, that, you know, sometimes it's not good to take too much money yeah, you just want to... He learned, actually, in so many years of, of making films, you know, it's, it's doing the film for the right budget. You know, because when you have too much, you know, you add so much stress to yourself, people are going to be really unhappy when the, money's, you know, the money disappears and, and everything is flushed down the drain if, if it doesn't make anything. You know, when you have too little, you have not enough to work with. I think we had just enough... Uh, yes, not to pay ourselves comfortably. I think we really, all of us, it was the first feature for him, for her, for me. Uh, we invested, I think we invested um, in the film, you know, as, as it being a showreel piece, as, as it being a piece that would prove that, yes, you know, we have a full-length film, such that it wasn't, talk, uh, it wasn't about taking a huge fee. Yes, um, if you were to look at the right way to budget this film, it, it would easily go up. Yes. Why do you choose the name as the journey of Ilo Ilo? I think we have to ask Ian Wee the question. <laughs> we had a few emails over this. Yeah. No, no. Uh, I think I think maybe her question is more about why the film is called Ilo Ilo. La. The seminar is called The Journey of Ilo Ilo, <laughs> but the film is called Ilo Ilo. The film is called Ilo Ilo because uh, when I was growing up, you know, my Filipino helper, she's from Ilo Ilo. And that is one of the things that I remembered very well. So at a very, 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 very early into the film, we, you know, it was already called Ilo Ilo. What was interesting is, after the film was made, we tried to work with the sales agent to come up with another title because I was thinking, yeah, this film doesn't, this title doesn't sound commercial. <laughs> so we came up with like 35 different titles and we didn't like any of them. Okay, um, I think we have to stop for the Q&A um, because we have to do the lucky draw, but we are all going to be around. <laughs> all right. Um, you all have to eat pretty fast, but let's do the lucky draw and everybody will still be around to actually field your questions. I'm, I have to apologize to those who have been actually like trying to wave at me and you know, as somebody SMS me and say, choose me and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs>